Two Chronicles, please. Uh, chapter 1 and verse 1. Now Solomon, the son of David, was strengthened in his kingdom. And the Lord his God was with him and exalted him exceedingly. The Lord his God was with him and exalted him exceedingly. First Kings chapter 3, verse number 7. First Kings 3 and 7. Here's Solomon praying. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am, notice the phrase, a little child. There's humility for you. I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Chapter 8. First Kings 8 and 54. So it was when Solomon had finally finished praying all this prayer and supplication to the Lord that he arose from before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. Then he stood and blessed all the congregation of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise which he promised through his servant Moses. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us nor forsake us that he may incline our hearts to himself to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments which he commanded our fathers. And may these words of mine which I have made Supplication before the Lord be near the Lord our God day and night that he may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel as each day may require that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and there is no other. Let your heart therefore be loyal to the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments as at this day. Then the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered to the Lord, 22,000 bulls, 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. That's all we read just for a moment, but keep your Bible open because I want to turn you to a few passages uh, as we go through. Lean hard on the word tonight. Don't you think it's a very easy thing to typecast people? What do you think it is? You know, actors uh, fear being typecast, but I suppose Arthur Lowe will always be remembered as Captain Mannering. Or Michael Crawford will always be remembered as Frank Spencer. And of course, the famous Betty. Shall we ever forget her? And even going further back, Charlie Chaplin, of course, will always be remembered as the famous little tramp. And sometimes what actors fear, we do with people in real life. You remember when we were studying Samson, that Samson actually ruled, I reckon, the people of God in peace and quiet for 18 years very successfully. But all we seem to remember him for is his relationship with Delilah. He's typecast. 
Thomas was a very faithful disciple of Jesus Christ for three years. Yet because of one moment of skepticism after the resurrection, we've typecast him forever as Doubting Thomas. He wasn't always Doubting Thomas. And Solomon has been very unfairly dealt with by biblical historians. Most historians concentrate on his latter life, the declining years of his life, as if his entire life was one massive shipwreck. Yet, if you read the preface to his biography, you will find the very opposite. His whole life was not a shipwreck. In fact, you will find that he was a young, eager king with a real tender heart for the things of the Lord. These passages that we have read together show you Solomon as the man of God. His private response to God in his heart was to trust God with a childlike trust. I am a little child, he said. I think it was my first visit to the Keswick Convention. I think it was the very first one. And the best part of the Keswick Convention for me is not the meetings. It is the fellowship that I have with fellow preachers in the preacher's hotel. We meet and we live in a hotel together for a week. And, uh, you know, it's wonderful to meet these men of God from all over the world. And they all laugh at me because I go down to breakfast and I usually bring my notebook with me. George B. Duncan once gave me an exposition of Nehemiah between pieces of toast. And I wrote it down. Because they say such lovely things and I, 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 I want to get them down. And I remember John Cager, those of you who are into the Keswick movement will know that John Cager was the one who uh, compiled the great Keswick hymn book. John Cager is a Baptist minister for what, maybe up in 50 years in London. And he once said something at lunchtime that I've never forgotten. He said, Derek, those who are greatest in the kingdom of God are those who are most like little children. Except you become as a little child, you remember Jesus said, but that's how John put it. Can I repeat that? Those that are greatest in the kingdom of God are those who are most like little children. Trusting. Dependent. It's a wonderful, wonderful attitude that Solomon had. I am a little child. There's no bombast. There's no sickening self-centeredness or ego at the start of his career for the Lord. Here is a man who has a childlike trust in God. And that's what you and I need in these days is a childlike trust in God. As a friend of mine says quite often to me, mine is a very simple faith. And well, there's a lot of truth in that. We get it very complicated sometimes, don't we? Jure is a simple faith. Simple in the sense that you, it's, it's not that it isn't profound, it's not that it isn't, isn't vast, it's not that it isn't as great as the universe itself and as God himself, but it's simple faith in Christ. Are you not a Christian tonight? Then I would say to you, it's only a step to Jesus. And why not take it now? Come and your sins confessing to him your Savior by. It's only a step. Only a step. Come. He waits for thee. I love that attitude, that, that private response of Solomon's heart. I am a little child, he says. I don't know how to go out or come in. And he's asking the Lord for wisdom. Solomon, as a direct result of his private relationship with God, was unashamedly public in his confession of faith. And we read that passage in 1 Kings 8. 
He publicly confesses his faith that came as a result of his childlike trust. I don't know what kind of trouble you're in, friend. I don't, wanna, I don't know what awful things may be happening to you, but I know that if you're out there, you'll not escape them. If you haven't had sorrow in your life, you will. You will. It comes to us all. And I don't know what you're going through, but in God's presence, I would say to you tonight, trust God as a little child trusts its parent. A childlike trust and attitude makes a difference. Humility, integrity, loyalty. I think if you were to typecast Solomon, these are qualities you could focus on. Now, Solomon was not only a man of God with childlike trust and childlike faith, but Solomon was, 1 Kings 4 now, an incredible composer and author. We sometimes forget this. 1 Kings 4, 29. 1 Kings 4, 29, And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceeding great understanding and the largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. That's a big heart, isn't it? Port Stewart Strand in your heart, yes. And all the rest too. Largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of the east. For he was wiser than all men. And I take it that this is the intellectual elite of those days. We, don't, we wouldn't be aware of them now, but in that day they were the intellectual elite. Ethan, the Ezraite, Heman, Chalcol, Darda, the sons of Mahal. And his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, little sayings. And you know how wonderful they are in the book of Proverbs. 3,000 of them. And his songs were 1,005. I wonder what the last five were. Notice the detail of Scripture. He wrote 1,005 songs. He also spoke of trees from the cedar tree of the Lebanon even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things and of fish and men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. So here is Solomon, not just man of God but author and composer. Writing music, botany, various branches of zoology. He was more brilliant than the intellectual elite of his day, author and composer. He had an appreciation of beauty, of diversity, and creativity. Some character, isn't he? Man of God, author and composer. Now chapter 4, 1 Kings 4. Here is Solomon, administrator and architect. 1 Kings 4, verse 2. These were his officials, Azariah, the son of Zadok the priest, Elahoroph, and Ahadjah, the sons of Shisha, scribes, Jehoshaphat, the son of Alud, the recorder, Beniah, the son of Jehoadada, of the army, Zadok and Abathar, the priests, Azariah, the son of Nathan, over the officers, Zabad, the son of Nathan, a priest, and the king's friend, Ashesur, over the household, and Adoniram, the son of Abda, over the labor force. Solomon had 12 governors over all Israel who provided food for the king and his household. Each one made provision for one month of the year. Verse 7, uh, down to verse number 19, shows you all the various administrators. So you see that Solomon was a man who had great gifts of administration. Here was a man who built houses, who built reservoirs, who built gardens, who built orchards, who built vineyards. 
Here is a man who, who built the temple, an incredible feat, seven and a half years it took to complete. Uh, and form was as important as function, and beauty was as important as utility. And you re will remember that when he built the beautiful temple, there wasn't a sign of a hammer in it, there wasn't a sign of an axe, nor any tool heard in the house when it was being built, because the stone was prepared at the quarry and taken and set up. Reverence paced the workers and penetrated the atmosphere of that construction site. In other words, he had it so well organized and so well administrated that there even was reverence for God in the very way those men built that temple. So we're getting a portrait now of Solomon. Don't uh, just let the biblical historians you have read that emphasize his, his faults take away the beautiful, beautiful points of character with which this young man set out to serve the Lord. Solomon was also a tremendous diplomat and a businessman. Now, I don't want to get into all of these scriptures now, but he made allies. He made trade. And uh, it was... Huge, the trade that he made. He had 40,000 stalls of horses. He had 12,000 horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots. And he, he set up trade routes. And he was a wonderful diplomat. Great statesman. Great businessman. He made silver as common uh, as, as uh, corn almost in the cities that he built. He chose the best animals. He made the best deals. And it's really quite incredible. If you look up those scriptures, they'll, they'll show you all the things that he did. If you have some time to study that, point number four on your note sheet. But what I want to get at tonight in God's presence is what happened? What happened? on earth went wrong. Why, and let me put it as bluntly as I can, did the wisest man in all the earth become an effeminate fool? And God tells us that he was the wisest man in the whole world. The world's a big place. Why could the wisest man in all the world become an effeminate fool? Well, I often think of what Charles Swindle tells when he was in his chemistry class of how his teacher put a little frog into the beaker and very quietly got the Bunsen burner and started to turn up the heat. And the frog never moved. And then turned the heat up more and the frog never moved. And then turned the heat up more and the frog never moved. And the poor old frog was boiled to death. And it never moved. And Swindle tells how that his chemistry master, cruel chemistry master, had taught him a powerful lesson. That slowly and quietly and subtly and powerfully your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he raises the temperature a little and you don't notice it. He raises it a little more and you don't notice it. He raises it a little more and you're, you're blind to it. And before you know where you are, he has you. Look at this mighty man of God. Look at him. God, says the word, had exalted him to a very high position in the world. There was no one as rich. There was no one as wise. He was the envy of millions. 
when he offered, when God offered him, if you like, a blank check, he didn't ask, God said, what would you want from me? He didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask for wealth. He didn't even ask for the life of those who hated him. He didn't even ask for a long life. But he said, Lord, give me wisdom and give me knowledge. And God was so well pleased with the sincerity of his heart, he gave him all of these things on top of the wisdom, exceedingly abundantly above all that he could ask or think. What on earth happened? How could such a mighty man of God fall? How could he backslide? What eroded this monument of wisdom? How could, the, how, how could it happen? That is my subject. That's the burden of my message. I would feel that one of the eroding influences upon the mighty Solomon was too much praise. The praise of man. 1 Kings 10, verse 1. Notice it. Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. She came to test him with hard questions. Verse 23, 1 Kings 10. So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom, and all the earth sought the presence of Solomon. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? All the earth wanted to meet him. All the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. They knew there was something different about this man. He had something in his heart. Each man brought his present, articles of silver and gold and garments and armor and spices and horses and mules at a set rate year by year. Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen, 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horsemen whom he stationed in the chariot cities with the king of Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones. And he made cedars abundant as the sycamore figs which are in the lowland. He had horses imported from Egypt and Keva. The king's merchants brought them from Keva at the current price. Now a chariot that was imported from Egypt cost 600 shekels of silver, the horse 150, and thus through their agents they exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria. Now I see this diplomat, this man of God, this author, this composer, this <coughs> architect. And what's wrong? It seems to me there was a regular parade of fans that pilgrimaged from all corners of the earth to behold Solomon in all his glory. And they paid him tribute. And they picked his brain on different matters and issues. They gathered the pearls of wisdom that cascaded from his, his lips, fortune and fame and friends and fulfilled fantasies became the daily delights of this incredible man. But you know how it is if you're out for dinner somewhere and you have too much dessert? If you get too much dessert, you'll sicken of it. And the pleasures that this man was enjoying of praise from all of these men sated his appetite and made him nauseous. In fact, Burns put it perfectly. Pleasures are like poppies spread. You seize the flower and its bloom is shed. Or like the snow falls on the river a moment white then melts forever. Is there somebody sitting in this great congregation this evening and you love the praise of people? You would do anything to have the praise of others. You live for it. 
It is your motivation in your business, in your academic career, or whatever. Oh, my friend, don't be foolish. The grass withers, the flower fades. But there's only one thing that lasts forever, and that's the Word of our God. You go in for spiritual things, and they'll last you much longer than the praise of men. My mother, she used to teach me a little verse that I have never forgotten. She used to put me over it and over it until I learned it. And really, it sums up what I'm saying here tonight. Some will hate thee, and some will love thee, and some will flatter, and some will slight. Cease from man and look above thee. Trust in God and do the right. Too much of the praise of men. I'm very fond of James Galway. I like his humility. I like his flute playing as well. I'll never forget Gloria Honeyford many years ago going to Geneva to meet James because he'd had a bad accident. Somebody had run into him on the streets of Geneva on a motorbike. And he's lying in a hospital on traction. And I remember very well the radio program, Gloria, sits down beside him and says, how do you feel, James? Well, he said, I think it's good for me. And she said, what do you mean? Well, he said, I was starting to believe what the posters were saying about me. And he was reminded of the brevity of life and that you don't live for fame and the praise of men because if you do you'll be very disappointed I tell you if you live for the praise of men and women you will be bitterly disappointed if that is the motivation of your life because one day they'll lift you the next day they'll drop you one day, as the great F.B. Mars said, they're all oranges. The next day, they're all lemons. Too much of the praise of men. I often am reminded of the young fellow who was praised in public before he got up to speak. And the man went on about how great this man was. And the fellow got carried away. And he stood up. He said, friends, I'm really looking forward to hearing myself speak. Yeah. Too much of the praise of men. He had an overfed ego. I have no doubt about that. Let's go to the book of Ecclesiastes. He had an overfed ego. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, chapter 2. Ecclesiastes 2, I said in my heart, come now, Ecclesiastes 2 and 1, I will test you with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure, but surely this is also vanity. I said of laughter, it is madness, and of mirth, what does it accomplish? I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine. While guiding my heart with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly. Till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. I made my works great. I built myself. Notice the I and the me and the mine. I made my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards. I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. I acquired male and female servants and had servants born in my house. I had, yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. My, here's ego, all right. I gathered for myself silver and gold and special treasures of kings of the provinces. I acquired male and female singers and delights of the sons of men and musical instruments of all kinds. So I became great 
and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I didn't withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works of my hands that my hands had done, and on the labor which I had toiled, and indeed all was vanity and grasping for wind. There was no profit under the sun. Got it? In other words, <laughs> I, me, and mine is dished up to him to a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth helping, and it comes and comes and comes until he's finally fed up with it all, and he pushes the plate away. It's all vanity. I'm convinced that the secret of the exposition of the book of Ecclesiastes, and it's a very difficult book to expound, is that everything under the sun, notice verse 11, there was no profit under the sun. In other words, if you just live for things under the sun, you'll not be satisfied. You're going to have to live for that which is beyond the sun. God himself, that which is above and beyond the earth and separate from it. But he didn't, did he? And he's nauseated. He was stuffed and nauseated. He was full of himself. He was full of life's pleasures. He was ready to throw up. You know those kind of places you go into sometimes, particularly in America, the all-you-can-eat buffet. You know, those kind of places. And somebody who's never been in one before goes mad. And you see them staggering around with Waldorf salads and you name it, and meat and all the rest of it. That all-you-can-eat buffet lifestyle. And you look at them, and what do they get out of it? Heartburn. Heartburn. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Oh, is there someone who is a backslider here tonight? And I speak to you tenderly and with compassion, for I've backslidden many a time myself. Is there someone here this evening, and you've been living for yourself? And you're sick to death of yourself. You and I aren't big enough to be the sole goal of our own existence. Have you got that? Learn that. Let me learn it. You and I are not big enough to be the sole goal of our existence. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Well, when will we ever learn that you can't live by bread alone? You can't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. His word, you need it. Ah, signs of erosion. Solomon is beginning to backslide. Too much praise isn't good for you. Too much praise isn't good for you. An overfed ego is very, very dangerous. And then there was an unwise alliance with an unbeliever. First Kings three and one. First Kings three and one. Now Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh king of Egypt and married Pharaoh's daughter and he brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall all around Jerusalem. Got that? What are we saying here? Well, we're
We're saying that he's made an unwise alliance. Chapter 7, verse 8. 1 Kings 7 and 8. And the house where he dwelt had another court inside the hall of like workmanship. Solomon also made a house like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had taken as wife. 9.16. 9.16. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up and taken Gezer and burned it with fire and had killed the Canaanites who dwelt in the city and had given it as a dowry to his daughter Solomon's wife. Verse 24. But Pharaoh's daughter came up from the city of David to her house, which Solomon had built for her. Now here's a wee verse, and you've been very patient in looking all of these things up, but here's a wee verse I want you to think about. 2 Chronicles 8 and verse 11. I'm just slipping this in because I think it'll help you understand what happened to him. It's very important. 2 Chronicles 8 and 11. I wonder, have you ever noticed this before? Now Solomon brought the daughter of Pharaoh up from the city of David to the house that he had built for her. For he said, 2 Chronicles 8 and 11, he said, My wife shall not dwell in the house of David, king of Israel, because the places to which the ark of the Lord has come are holy. Now what's that saying? Well, what it is saying is, it seems to me categorically, is that Solomon knew that a woman from an unholy background had no business being in this holy place. That's what that verse is saying, 2 Chronicles 8 and 11. My wife shall not dwell in the house of David. Why? Because that's where the ark of the Lord was. We had that last week, didn't we, in our message? You remember that message? And that's a holy place. That's God's throne, the ark of God on earth, the mercy seat. And I know that my wife doesn't understand these things, has no affiliation with it, so therefore she can't dwell in David's house. You see the detail of the word of God. He was unequally yoked. And if you have an unequal yoke, that means you're going to get blistered shoulders. It means you're going to be pulled off the path of obedience and fall. You're going to be crippled. You're going to go into the ditch. If you're unequally yoked, unevenly yoked. Solomon's marriage with Pharaoh's daughter was a union of two nations. It was not a union of two hearts. It was a marriage of expedience. It wasn't according to God's precepts. It was based on political diplomacy. It was not based on love. And God laid down specific instructions in Deuteronomy 7 to Israel regarding intermarriage with those that didn't love the Lord. And here is this godly, brilliant wise, outstanding diplomat, administrator, architect, author, composer, wisest of men. And he hears too much praise and it starts to erode his life. He gets an overfed ego. He begins to think too much of himself. And then he brings a woman into his life that doesn't love the Lord. I wonder, is there somebody in here tonight? You're just like that. You say, oh, Derek, don't come too close. Well, my friend, what do you think this is here for? Do you think the Bible is just a a history book? I love J.B. Phillips' famous statement when he came to translate the scriptures into a modern translation. He said, I sat down to translate the scriptures And I discovered it was like rewiring a house with the mains still switched on. This book is living. This book is different to any other book. This book is the very breath of God. This is the inerrant word of the living God to your soul and to mine. And why do you think all these verses are put in here? Even that little tiny detail 
that he wouldn't take her into David's house because she wasn't a spiritual woman to warn us. I wonder would the Lord let me tonight stand in your path, my dear young woman? Would he allow me tonight to stand in your path and say, leave him, that young man that you are with who doesn't love the Lord that you have an unholy alliance with. You're not married to him yet, fortunately. But you know it's wrong, this relationship. I wonder, would the Lord allow me tonight just to save your heartache? Why do we have these kind of things in Scripture? For a very simple reason. As we learned last week, the Lord doesn't want you to enter into a marriage that has an unshared treasure, namely himself. Is there some fellow in your life and he doesn't love the Savior and he doesn't love the Word? Yes, he might love you. And you're entering into an uneven, unequal yoke. Would the Lord allow me tenderly and gently with all the love I, I can muster in my heart because I love you in Christ. I'm not your enemy. I stand here to pastor your very soul. Don't go on with it. Is there a young man sitting in front of me tonight or an older man or woman and you have entered into this relationship and could the Lord use me to stand in front of you and say, don't go on with an alliance with unbelievers. It's a very dangerous thing. Why? Because it eroded this man's life. You say, would it really? Well, of course it did. Because then he began, you will notice, to have an unrestrained preoccupation with sex. In fact, it's quite disgusting. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse number 1. And I don't like to have to read this. And I don't want you to take it as humorous because it isn't although outwardly it appears to be it's dead serious warning us Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh women of the Moabites Ammonites Edomites Sidonians and Hittites from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel you shall not intermarry with them nor they with you for surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods and Solomon clung to these in love. Sure he loved them, but they didn't love the Lord. And he had 700 wives. Goodness, the thought of it. I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? And I know we could say all sorts of witty things. Well, can you imagine that lot going to the supermarket on a Friday night or whatever? But that's not what it's in there for. It shows you the stupidity of the man. And when people get onto this sexual, <coughs> unrestrained sexual streak in their lives, they begin to really sink. And they go down, go down, 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 down into it until it has them by the very throat. It consumes them. I've seen it in my lifetime. An unrestrained preoccupation with sexual things. And he had 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as was the heart of his father David. He indulged himself, didn't he, in a harem. Unequaled in the Near East. It was an unrestrained preoccupation with sex, really, that ultimately led him away from God. But you'll notice that, and, and I often want, I often say this, and, and I really, I really do believe this. 
No building collapses all of a sudden. No garden suddenly is overwhelmed with weeds. No marriage suddenly falls apart. There is an erosion that takes place, bit by bit by bit, as one partner or the other <coughs> gives way to things that they know to be wrong. As a result of his seductive wives, they adulterated his heart. I wonder where your heart lies tonight. Where does your heart lie? Where does my heart lie? When Sir Walter Raleigh was being beheaded, poor man, the executioner said to him, How does your head lie, Sir Walter? He says, When you come to where I am, it doesn't matter where your head lies. It's where your heart lies. Where does your heart lie? The scriptures are very clear. His heart was not loyal to the Lord his God. Are you loyal? to the Lord in your heart. Am I loyal in private, in public, everywhere I go? Am I loyal to the Lord? It's a big challenge and Solomon's granite character begins to erode away, adulterated in his heart by these women. 1 Kings chapter 11 verse number 4 to verse number 8. Solomon went after, we've read verse 4, verse 5. 1 Kings 11, Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. And Solomon built a high place for Shemesh, the abomination of Moab on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Moloch the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I, command, which I commanded you, I'll surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David, but I'll tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom, but I'll give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Have you any idea what you're going to lose, Christian, if you go on down this path you're on? Hmm? Have you thought about it? This unholy flirting with idolatry in your heart. And when the foreign wives came in, a spirit of religious infidelity infiltrated the nation. The whole nation now begins to be affected with this poison. God's word was slipping further out of Solomon's hand as his commitment to God slowly relaxed. And as he flirted with other gods, it opened up the sluice gates of erosion. I would call every Christian in the presence of God tonight back to our rededication of your heart to your Lord. I'd call every Christian here tonight to take a warning from this powerful story that no matter how great the man or the woman, no matter how gifted, no matter how outstanding, we can all come down and make a shipwreck of our lives. And I would say, you keep your heart and the rest will take care of itself. I certainly have found that the secret of keeping going in these days is to make sure that my heart is loyal to the Lord who died for me every day. And many a morning I rise and just as I come up out of sleep, 
You know those moments when you come out of sleep? I would try to say, Lord, I'm yours. This is your day. You just have this day and you do with me what you want to do with me. Just help me to serve you and be loyal to you. It's very important how you start the day. Are you loyal? I, I, I find it incalculably sad that this young man who started out so brilliantly should end up so ignominiously with this hell east of Jerusalem with an altar to other gods pleasing a lot of women in his life and the Lord angry with him was it worth it? it wasn't worth it it's not worth it for you either I felt God speaking here tonight it's hard to put in the words since I've started to preach I have felt I have felt God speaking God is speaking this night and I know it and I'm no prophet neither am I the son of one but I know in my heart this night for the spirit registers with my spirit that God is at work could it be that this great congregation in the Lord's presence in this city tonight those of you who I've trusted Christ as your Savior. I call you, including myself, back to a closer walk with God and to a loyalty to Him. Don't live for the praise of men. Don't let your ego get overfed. Don't make an unwise alliance with unbelievers. That doesn't mean to say you don't have contact with unbelievers, but don't make an unwise alliance with them. Don't have an unrestrained preoccupation with sexual things in your life. And don't flirt with other gods in your heart. Remain loyal. And the Lord will bless you. What a story. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank you this evening for this amazing history of this incredible character. And we have felt you, Lord, speaking and tugging at the very root of our lives tonight. And we would, Lord Jesus, we would honestly, in your presence, make this a place of rededication. Lord, we would go out of this building this evening, out into whatever work there is for us tomorrow or whatever, whatever the future holds to make a covenant in our hearts that we will be on all occasions loyal to the one who was not ashamed of us and who bled and died for us. Father, just help us to watch for signs of erosion in our Christian lives and help us to keep our hearts by your power through reading your word and prayer for out of it are the issues of life and maybe even quietly now Lord at the end of this day all over this building there may be those without Christ and maybe Father by your grace you will draw them at this very moment to say Christ for me I take you Lord Jesus as my saviour may they say and mean it and leave this place born again Save many souls this night and make us sincere Christians. Not backslidden ones, not half-hearted ones, not compromising ones, but loyal to the Lord always until we see his face. And the people of God said, Amen.